Psalm 77. And then we're going to go to John 4, but um, God had a plan this morning, what he wanted to do. And uh, so we're going to work with the time that we have left and, and, and say what the Lord wants us to say. I'm going to read a few verses of scripture, then we're going to pray and uh, see where the Lord takes us. Psalm 77, verse 13. Oops, I'm in the wrong psalm. Psalm 77, verse 13 says, Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people. And then we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And then in chapter 4, verse 20, he says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And so, Father, once again, we just want to thank you and praise you for your faithfulness. We commit ourselves to you, Lord, and we pray that you'll speak to our hearts today and you'll open up our eyes, open up our minds, Lord God, open up our understanding to see, to hear, to know what you have for us this day, Lord, as we look to you and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, this, people today are looking for the same thing that they were looking for when Jesus walked on the earth. They don't want to come and listen to somebody who... Uh, sounds real great or they don't want to come to see a light show or they don't want to come for a great program. What, what people really want is, is a real experience with God. They want to know that God is real. They want to know that God is, is a God of power and, and that he loves them and cares for them. See, there's nothing that is too difficult with God. Is God real? And I was reading uh, in, in a journal that I had and, I, and I, I used to journal years and 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 years ago. Only one year of my life, actually, that I actually journal. But I was looking back at it. This was in 1981 and 1982 when I was in Youth of the Mission. And it was before I was married to Suzanne. And, and, and I was reading about, you know, how God calls us to live up to what we know. And I had just been through a discipleship training school, three months of intense teaching, and and then two months of outreach, and I'd just been through a school of evangelism, three more months of intense teaching. And, and, I, and, I, and I said, wow, Lord, I, I really know a lot. And I have to live up to what I know. But then the Lord said, I was reading in Galatians. And, the, and, and Paul, he said to Paul, you know, that the gospel I preach is not something that man made up. I wasn't taught it by any man, nor did, nor did it come to me by any man. But I, I, I received it by a revelation from Jesus Christ. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you know, all the, the head knowledge you have isn't really knowledge until it becomes revelation knowledge, until I reveal myself to you, until I reveal it to you. See, and that's, how, that's what it is with the Bible, and that's what's so good about the Bible. And that's what, see, the Bible is a living document. It's living words. And so every time you come to it, God can reveal something to you through it, and it can become revelation knowledge. And when it's, when it's head knowledge, it, it's, it's, it's good, it's one thing, head knowledge is one thing, but when it's revelation knowledge to you, when the light goes on and you really understand, it's a completely different level of knowledge then. It's just, a, it's, just a, you know, it's, it's a whole other dimension that God wants to bring us to uh, in, 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 in understanding the power of God. And so God wants to reveal himself to you. And sometimes, you know, God does it in spite of ourselves. Sometimes, you know, like the Apostle Paul, you know, we might think it was in spite of himself, but when the Apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus, God, you know, struck him down right there. A bright light flashed around him, and he heard a voice, and it was like, you know, he wasn't looking for Jesus. As a matter of fact, he was fighting Jesus at the time. He, he, was, he, wasn't, he wasn't, you know, not only was he not uh, kind towards Jesus, he was persecuting him. He was dragging Christians and bringing them to prison, and he was 
He was killing them. When they were being stoned, he was the first one to cast a vote to have them killed. And he, and he was guarding in their clothes when Stephen was killed. See, he, he, was, he was hostile to Jesus. He wasn't looking for Jesus but, Jesus. but Jesus, in spite of all that, revealed himself to Paul. Sometimes God does that, but that, that's a rare thing. God hasn't done that to too many people. Oftentimes, what, is it, what do we read in Jeremiah 29? It says that you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart, and I will be found by you. So it's when we seek after him. It's, it's, it's in this process of actively seeking after God. So how do you seek after God? Well, you have to, you have to seek after God God's way. You've got to come to the, the way that he, that he made, made known to us. And, and number one is the, the, what, what Pastor Ron was talking to us about this morning. is about the church. How important is the church of Jesus Christ? It's important for us to be together. And, and the church is one of the places that God has set up. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And it's so important for us to be in church because that is one of the places that God can use, hopefully, <laughs> I think maybe a lot of us in the church, we've gotten off, off center a little bit. We've gotten off track from what God really wants us to be. But I believe that in 2016 that God is bringing the church back in. You see, because, you know, we're living in desperate times. Look at the world around you right now. It is not, the, the, the world that I live in today is not the world I was born into. The America that I live in today is not the America that I was born into. It is completely changed. Completely changed. And, and specifically within the last eight years, there have been changes in this country that are mind-boggling, mind-blowing, that some of the younger generation, they have no idea. They have no understanding about these changes. They, they just accept them because to them, that's what this world, that's what America is. But for those of us who are a little bit older, we know, no, America is not what it used to be. And you want, want to know whose fault it is? It's the church's fault. It's the church's fault because we haven't been the church. We haven't been seeking revelation. We've been seeking after, this isn't my message. You know, God has really spoken to my heart. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've shared it, you know, a little bit, but God said, Michael, you need to change things up. You are complacent in your relationship with me. You keep doing the same thing every, every day. And it may sound spiritual, reading 20 chapters a day may sound spiritual. But he says, you know, I think maybe I called you to stop doing that a long time ago, and you just keep doing it. For, for years I've been doing it. It's become wrote to you. You need to get on your face. You need to get on your knees. I was talking with Lucy Rahal. I know she's here somewhere. We were talking about that. You know, God has really been just, and others of you, I know. There's others of you. I know. You know, God has been talking to us about really seeking his face. Not just saying, I'm going to pray for you, but praying. I was reading <laughs> in that journal, and I read something that has been a, a theme in my life. Reading books about prayer. You know what God said to me? He said, would you stop reading books about prayer and start praying? Get on your knees. And I'm, listen, does Pastor Mike not pray? Yes, of course Pastor Mike prays. But I used to always get up in the morning, make my cup of coffee and sit in my Bible and, and, and ask God to speak to me. And God, and God would. God has been faithful all this time. But he's been telling me for years now, Pastor Mike, he doesn't call me Pastor Mike, by the way. He calls me Mike. <clears throat> Or he calls me dummy or whatever. No, he never calls me that. He's ne no, George, he's never called me that. Where is he? <laughs> because he respects me. No, <laughs> he loves me. He can call me whatever he wants still, really. But he doesn't call me Pastor Mike. <laughs> he said, I just, I just, I just want to get to know you again. I want you to get to know me again. And I want you just to, you know, spend time with me in prayer in the morning and just, you talk to me and let me talk to you. Just talk to me and I'll talk to you. 
And then, and then he, he speaks to me. And he speaks so strongly to me. See, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And the power doesn't come from, the power doesn't come from traditions or from doing the same thing over and over again. You know, this worship service might have been different than, than we've had before. And some people might say, why are they singing the same song over and over and over and over? Go to Revelation. The 24 elders are around the throne. What are they doing? Day and night, they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. They never stop. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is. Holy, they just keep saying it over for 20, day and night, they never, day and night, they never stop. And the Lord, you know, the Lord was making a place right here for us just to say, I want to meet with you right up there. I want to touch you today. I want to heal you today. I want to move in power in your life. I want to move in power in your life. The story of the royal official in John chapter 4, it's, it's a pretty powerful story. I'm, I'm going to read it, say maybe two or three things about it. <laughs> I'm going to start in verse 46. It says, once, once more, he, that's Jesus, visited Cana in Galilee where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. And when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, He went to him and, and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said, you may go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and, and departed. Some translations or most translations say the man believed Jesus' word. And while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. And when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. The father, rather than the father, realized. Realized. See, that when, when revelation comes to you, I once heard a definition like this, that revelation is realizing something you've already known. A revelation is real. In other words, I had head knowledge, but it had to become revelation knowledge. That's what I was talking about. Revelation, when God reveals something to you, it's, it's realizing something, maybe even for the first time, but maybe again, maybe for the 20th time. Because God can, can, can reveal things to us again and again and again, because he needs to be. You know why? Because we're sheep. And you want to know what? Sheep are the dumbest of animals. And we're likened to sheep. So it says, then the father realized, in other words, his eyes were opened at this point. Then he realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and all his household believed. This was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed having come from Judea to Galilee. Just a powerful story. Here we have a royal official a Jewish official, probably in, in the palace of Herod, who, who would have had, he would have been privy to the best care that anyone could have received in that day as a royal official, as someone who was in a high place. But this, this royal official comes to a village carpenter that, that's who Jesus was. He was the, the village carpenter. Because Jesus was back in Galilee, which is where he was from. Judea was the southern part. Samaria was in the middle. We just saw Jesus went through Samaria. That's John chapter 4, the woman at the well. And the Samaritans all believed in him. And then he went up into the northern region of Galilee. And Nazareth was up in Galilee as well. And so this is Jesus is back in, in his own home area. Right before that, it tells us in the text that 
prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. In other words, back in Galilee, you know, people weren't really trusting him. But here's this royal official, and he goes to a village carpenter. And one of the things that that tells us is that, you know, God wants to move in power in your life, but sometimes for God to move in power in your life, you have to be willing to humble yourself. We have to be willing to humble ourselves. You know, you might not think that, you know, this was Jesus. <laughs> but you've you got to realize that even in, you know, in, in, in Jesus' time, Jesus was probably despised. He was not a, a disciple of any rabbi. He did not go to any doctor or physician schools. You know, Luke, the Bible tells us that Luke, well, not the Bible doesn't tell us, but tradition tells us. Luke was a physician. He was trained. He went to the schools. He was a doctor. They call him Dr. Luke. Not Jesus. Jesus was a son of a carpenter, which means that very, he, was, he was a carpenter. Mark's gospel in chapter 6 says that he was a carpenter and that he was the son of Mary. And, and the fact that they don't say that he was the son of Joseph, but that he was the son of Mary, might even be pointing to the fact that everybody knew Jesus was an illegitimate child. So he was this illegitimate child. He was a carpenter. And so he was, he was really, he wasn't like, he wasn't, he wasn't on the same level as this royal official. The royal official was up here and Jesus was down here. Now, Jesus wasn't, you know, I mean, he, he, he wasn't the lowest of the low. He had a profession. But, you know, in those days, you see, in the United States of America, we, we really, we, there's, a, there's such a thing as a middle class. In most of the world, there has never been such a thing as a middle class. There was the rich and the poor, and the, never the twain shall meet. And Jesus was the poor, and the royal official was the rich. And so it was a humbling thing for this man to go to Jesus. Because you have to understand, too, this is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He doesn't even have the reputation yet, per se. But it started to grow. You see, the, the, the royal official has heard something. Because if you go back in chapter, chapter uh, 4 here, if you go back to verse 45, it says, When he, Jesus, arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. See, they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, for they also had been there. And this royal official might also have been there being a Jew. He might have been in Jerusalem. He might have seen the things that Jesus was doing in Jerusalem, the power that was going forth from him. Or if not, he heard about it and what drove this royal official is the same thing that drives you and I oftentimes it was need he had a need his son was sick and dying there's nothing like need to drive us to Jesus and you know in, in a moment of when things are going well, we might be too proud to go down to this lowly carpenter man, but, but in a time of need, we'll humble ourselves and we'll go. That's why sometimes God allows things in our lives because he sees, you know, but what, what is original sin? Original sin is pride. And, and, and every one of us has a measure of pride and, and every one of us has to battle that pride and there's, there's a pride in each one of us that, that will only go so far and sometimes Jesus has to do something to get us to go where he wants us to go. He has to allow something. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Jesus says to him, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, and it's all plural here, he's not just speaking to the man himself. He's speaking to all of them that are there. He says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. Here comes this man to Jesus, and it, it almost sounds like he's saying, do I, do I have to perform another miracle? Do I have to do another healing? Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders. I don't have time to expand on, expound on this per se, why he even said this, but there's, there's reasons why. See, Jesus didn't want people following him just because he performed miracles, which he did. But he wanted them to get to know him. There's such a contrast between this section right here and what the Samaritans did. Because if you go back to verse 41 of the Samar when it, uh, it says about the Samaritans, and because of his words, many, became, many more became believers. Because of his words, many more became believers. Not because of, see, he wasn't performing miracles in Samaria. He did speak a prophetic word to the woman at the well. You've had five husbands, and the one you're now with is not your husband. You, what you have just said is, is, is true. And that was a revelation to her. Wow, this man is a prophet. And she went and told, uh, to the, told all the other Samaritans, I've come here, a man who told me everything I ever, I ever did. And it says many of the Samaritans believed in him because of her words. But then they heard Jesus, and they said they believed in him because of his words. Is that enough for you? 
Just the word of Jesus. See, that's the whole point of this story. He was, he's rebuking the Galileans because they were following him, not because of his words or, what, or, or, or the truth that came from him, but because they had seen him do all this stuff in Galilee. It's like the group in chapter 6 now. They, they're rushing to make Jesus king, you know, in chapter 6, not because they want him to do something for him. They want something from Jesus. You know, you know uh, Moses gave us manna in the wilderness. What will you do? <laughs> I just fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. That wasn't enough for them. See, miracles are never enough. There's got to come to a point where, where, where the word is going to be what's going to change us. And taking Jesus at his word. You know, God has done, listen, this whole series is about God doing miracles. And there's a miracle that happens right here in this, in this text. But what Jesus wants more than anything else is for you to take him at his word. To believe his word. To believe his word. He humbled himself and went to the carpenter and then then Jesus discourages him. He says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. It reminds me of the Syrophoenician woman. He says to her, he says, uh, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Pastor Beeb alluded to this last week. Is that, you know, it, oftentimes, it, when the Lord wants to move in power in your life, oftentimes there's going to come a, a thing that almost looks like there's a discouragement that comes your way. David. David is going to go fight Goliath. He, he comes, he visits them, and, and, and the, the Goliath comes out and taunts Israel, and, and he says, who is this? I'll, I'll go and fight him. And his brother, his brother Eliab hears him, and he goes and he starts rebuking him. And he says, w- w- why have you come out here? I know you, you just came out here to see, the, I know how conceited you are. And his brother, his own brother is attacking him. He feels the call of God in his life and he, he, wants to be moved, he wants to be used by God to do something powerful and, and his own brother's attacking him. So sometimes when, when God is speaking to you and when God has something for you to do, you're gonna, you're gonna face discouragement and sometimes it might even come from the Lord. That's what is happening right here. He's saying, unless you people see miraculous signs, he's testing us. Are you gonna press through no matter what? When blind Bartimaeus was crying out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. All this as all the crowds rebu- rebuked him. You know, you know what? I can imagine them saying, he doesn't care about you. You're a blind person, you know, just like in John chapter 9, you were steeped in sin at birth. Well, he doesn't care about you, but what did Jesus, he, did he be quiet then because the people rebuked him? No, it says he shouted all the louder, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. See, he didn't give up because discouragement came. We can't give up because discouragement comes. If things seem to be going against you where you're at right now, don't give up. Don't give up. God wants you to press through even farther. See, he's telling them, he says this to the man, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. But what does the royal official say? Well, I guess I'm just going to go home then. No, he says, sir come down before my child dies you see there was something about Jesus that he he had come to believe and know that he wasn't going to let go it's like it's like Jacob when he was wrestling he would not let go he said I will not let go of you until you bless me sir come down before my child dies And then Jesus says, you may go. Your son will live. This was the moment of the real test right here. Here's the real test. You may go. Your son will live. Now, Jesus is in Cana. The royal official is from Capernaum. That's a distance of almost 20 miles. So it, the next thing we read is this. The royal official, and I mean, the man took Jesus at his word and departed. I'm reminded of the story of Deborah and Barak. When Sisera, the commander of the army of, of the Canaanites in, in Hazor was, Hazor, uh, and they were oppressing the Israelites and Deborah says to Barak, go and attack him. He says, I'm not going to go unless you come with me. If you go, I'll go. But if you don't go, I'm not going. 
they didn't really believe. Barak didn't really believe that the message was from the Lord. He wasn't going to go unless Deborah went with him. Now, God still moved in power and used Barak, but he says, but because of the way you're going about this, she says to him, the glory is going to go to a woman. And that's where Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, comes in. That's a whole other story, though. Sisera is handed into her hands and not into Barak's, even though they have this great victory. But the royal official doesn't do that. He doesn't say, unless you come with me, I won't go. I'm not going to He says, he took him at his word. He took him at his word. And he went. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. I'm going to be joining you in a moment. We're just going to close. When I was, I was 21 years old and I was in youth of the mission. Some of you have heard me tell this story before, but it, it, it just goes right with the story about what it means to take Jesus at his word. When I, when I was in youth of the mission, my second school, I, I really had no money whatsoever. And as many of you know my testimony, I, I had fallen when I was home in between the schools and I had, I was getting high with my brothers and I was just, uh, I was really struggling with, with, with drugs. And I thought because of that, they would never take me back to the school, but they said, no, more than that, more than ever, we want you back. So this was a real struggle that I was having, but uh, I also went home and I had a lot of bills that I had to pay. And I was actually being sued because when I left, I had a lease on an apartment and, and I left my brother in it and they, they did a lot of damage to it. And when they called my brother for money, he just railed at them. So then, the, then, but my name was on the lease, so I was liable. And so I worked that whole summer to pay that off. And then I just, I read from Proverbs 15, 1, where it says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So I said, I'm not going to respond harshly to these people like my brother John did. I'm going to call him and I'm going to say, you're exactly right. I was wrong. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And so all summer long, I was paying them off. And then finally, they just said, you know what, Michael, you've been so good to us. Just consider it done. It's all paid off. You don't have to pay us any more money. But because of that, I went back to the second school with zero dollars. And I owed everything. I was in uh, a service one day where we were talking about that and, and we were praying about it and they were saying, you know, Michael doesn't have any money. There was, a, there was about four of us at that time. We all hadn't paid our bills off yet and, and none of us was going to be able to go to Mexico or outreach to Mexico unless our whole bill was paid. So here I am. I have a couple thousand dollars I owe and, and that's a lot of money today but it was even a lot more money back then and, and, I, and, I, and I'm praying and I'm saying, Lord, what am I going to do about this? And, and the Lord just prompts me go to Psalm 138. And as I go to Psalm 138 and I open it up and I start reading, my heart just starts beating out of my chest. For like 20 minutes it was beating. And I got this verse 8 and it says, the Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. Now, that, that's the NIV, but I was reading it in the New American Standard Bible, and I forgot to tell Ben this, but this is what it says in the New American Standard. It says, the Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is everlasting. Do not forsake the work of your hands. And so he was saying to me, I will do this, Michael. I will pay off this bill. I want you to stand. I want you to... You know, basically saying, I want you to take me at my word. Because they were asking us, if you know anybody, get a loan. If you know anybody, get a loan. And I said, and I just, I read it out. I didn't even tell anybody there what the Lord was saying to me. I just read it out and I knew. I says, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you. And slowly but surely, a little bit of money started coming in. And it's getting to about Christmas time. And we were leaving in just, at, just at, in January. We were leaving to go to Mexico. And it's about Christmas time. And, and I still owe uh, about about a thousand dollars I also had a loan that I had to pay on my Marshall stack amplifiers <laughs> and I also had some money that I had pledged to 
the urban team, which was in Boston. And I hadn't made good on it. So I went to my Aunt Carol's house for Christmas in Manhattan, and she gave me the money to pay off the loan on my amps. And then I went back and still owe thousand dollars. It's after Christmas, we're leaving in early January. Leaving in a couple of days, I still owe a thousand dollars. And now they're, we have a meeting and they're pressuring us, is there anybody that you know where you can get loans? And I'm thinking, I'm sure there is. And, and, I, and I just, I wasn't released from the Lord, so I, I said, no. God's going to do this for me. Well, that day, somebody came up to me and gave me $70. The amount that I had pledged to the urban team. So I knew I couldn't keep it. So I gave it to the urban team in obedience to what I had said I would do. I knew I had to honor God. Still owe him close to $1,000. Somebody comes to me later on that day and he gives me a check for $300. This is the day before we're supposed to leave now, 24 hours to go. Give me a check for $300 and some other little bits that come in. Now it's down to $585.71. It's the night before we're going to leave now. It's, I don't know what night it was. Let's say it was Friday night. We're leaving Saturday morning. I owe $585. Nick Savoka gets up. He's our director, and he tells everybody, if there's anybody here that can loan some money to Pastor Mike or Betsy, well, I wasn't Pastor Mike at the time. If there's anyone here who can loan some money to Mike or, or Betsy, she was the only other one who owed money. You know, you can loan it to them, and you won't lose, it. You won't lose any of it. They'll pay it all back to you. And I'm saying, well, he said that, but I'm, I'm not saying that. I didn't, I didn't get up and say that, but that, Somebody, some, a girl came out to me and said, I can loan you $200. Somebody else said, I have some friends that can loan you the money. I says, you know what? Let me pray about it. And I prayed. And no, the Lord has not released me to accept it. I'm sorry, I can't accept it. And in a, and in a moment of, of doubt, because it's now less, it's a couple hours, you know, we're going to bed and we're going to be leaving in the morning. In a moment of doubt, I said, well, well in the morning, I'll let you know if I need the loans. In the morning, you know, who knows, it would be too late. But the Lord said, no. Don't accept those loans. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Thy loving kindness, O Lord, is everlasting. Do not forsake the work of thy hands. I said, Lord, <laughs> it's 10.30 at night. We're leaving tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. What are you going to do? $585.71. It might as well have been a million dollars to me. I didn't have a penny. I go into the bathroom. It's a men's bathroom. and I'm brushing my teeth. Someone taps me on the shoulder. I want to talk to you. They take me to the fellowship hall. This was somebody from Suzanne's school, the DTS. I was in the SOE. She was in the discipleship training school. I was in the school of evangelism. Taps me on the shoulder and says, I want to pay off your bill. No loan. The Lord spoke to me and he says, and this is why. And he explained to me what the Lord had said to him and why he wanted to pay off my bill. See, it was an opportunity for me to know when God speaks, does he fulfill? Does he act when he promises? Does he fulfill? Now, I could have given in at 7 o'clock at night and said, okay, I'll take the loans. And you want to know what? I would have never saw how God keeps his word. God is speaking to every one of us every day. He has something he wants to reveal to you. You need to take him at his word and you need to believe him and know that he is going to uphold his word. He's going to fulfill his word. He's not going to leave you nor forsake you because he loves you. He loves you and he's real.
There's power in the name of Jesus. And that's just one of many stories that, that Suzanne and I can tell of how God met us when we needed it most. But when God speaks, see, that's one of the things you need to, to really make sure you know. You need to know that God is speaking to you, and he does. And oftentimes when God speaks to me, my heart just starts beating out of my chest. Has that ever happened to you? God's speaking to you, and he wants to move. We're just going to close with this same song that we were singing earlier. Just worship the Lord. Allow God to speak to your heart and know there's power in his name. And he will break every chain. If you trust him, he will break every chain. There is nothing in your life that he can't remove that is hindering you in your relationship with him. And there's nothing, you know, relationships that were spoken to us today, God wants to heal and restore you. know, what relationship right now do you need God to move in? He spoke it today. He's going to do it. There's power in the name of Jesus. Take him at his word. The altars are open, or you can just worship the Lord right where you're at. We're going to close. Let's all stand together and worship the Lord.